Uh, now we're going to uh, turn over to uh, Josh to uh, listen and learn from his experience um, about the real AppSec issues. And I uh, can't wait to hear how you define uh, reality in this uh, crazy digital universe in which we all occupy. So, uh, Josh, take it away. Yeah, hi, Gary. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, I guess saying the real AppSec issues is a little cheeky. Um, but yeah, I guess the overall idea is to, I guess, I, you know, Obviously, Liav's talked about sort of quite a technical perspective and the you know, technical processes that the software goes through and the product goes through to actually make it to the you know, to, to deployment. And now I want to talk a little bit about, I guess, slightly higher level, sort of the more sort of process aspects. So uh, before I dive into that, uh, a little bit about me. So my name is Josh Grossman. I uh, work as a CTO consultant at a company called Bounce Security. Uh, we specialize in software security consulting. So that means I work with lots of organizations, both locally here in Israel, also around the world, and basically helping them to build software more securely. Basically working with developers, working with security people who are tasked with building software securely. Uh, I've also delivered various different talks and training. I've delivered training at uh, OWASP Global Conferences and at Black Hat USA. Um, again, all around this, this overall topic. So... Uh, I means I see lots of different environments, lots of different organizations, and hope to get a feel for the sort of challenges that, that organizations see, um, especially at the more, more strategic level. Uh, in, my, in my spare time, I'm very involved with OWASP, the Open Worldwide Application Security Project. I'm a co-leader of the uh, OWASP ASVS project, which you can find talks about me on, on the internet, uh, or talks that I've done about it on the internet. Um, I'm also on the uh, OWASP Israel chapter board. So... Uh, it's a great organization if you want to learn more about software security. And maybe we'll talk about a little bit more about that later on. Uh, and for my actual hobbies, I think I put a few photos up there. But um, so let's dive, let's dive straight in. So, I mean, again, the other part of some uh, statistics as well. I pulled my statistics from something called the uh, Verizon Data Breach uh, Investigations Report, which is basically Verizon uh, Instant Response Organization. They go around and respond to incidents at, at their clients. And they provide statistics at the end of each year about what sort of things they've seen, what sort of issues they've seen, what sort of you know, caused the actual instance that they saw. And you know, consistently for many years now, applications, especially web applications, have been very high up on you know, where, where do these incidents actually come from? What actually happened here? How did this start? So you know, I think we clearly see that there is a real challenge in this area. This is a real problem that we need to address. Um, you know, application security isn't a new issue either. You know, if we go back to um, Frack Magazine in 1998, uh, this was probably the first time that uh, SQL injection was spoken about. So you know, we're getting on for you know, 25, 30 years here, um, talking about SQL injection. But nevertheless, we can see that you know, 2021, the OWASP top 10, most people have heard of OWASP, have heard, heard of the OWASP top 10. This is the most recent version. Um, hopefully a new version will come out this year in 2024. But uh, right now, this is the most recent version of the OWASP top 10. And what's item number three? Injection. So, you know, I can tell you that, you know, we're now in 2024. We still haven't solved SQL injection. Um, we've been, <laughs> I actually posted a question about uh, SQL injection and how to prevent it uh, only a few, few weeks ago, because it's still very much a, a recurring topic. Yes, it's not something we've we've managed to solve pervasively. You know, software security is hard. Software security is still challenging. And uh, like I say, I think I'll, the idea for my talk now is to talk a little bit about the, the strategic drivers behind that. And so obviously it's a little bit more difficult to get people to stick their hands up in a webinar. Um, but I like to think about uh, this, this flow chart as to, okay, why should I care? You know, is this my problem or not? So I like to think about, well, Okay, are you responsible for application security in your organization? If so, then great, you know you're responsible for it. Um, or you don't think so. Okay, well, are you in development, the engineering side? Are you in the security side? You know, either way, do you know who is responsible? Because if you don't know who's responsible, it may well be you. Um, ultimately, you know, there may be someone that's specifically responsible for this, but often it gets put at the feet of you know, mainstream security organization, the main sort of either the CISO org or the main you know, secure information security managers, they're also considered to be responsible for, for software security. Uh, this is especially problematic because, you know, there are plenty of organizations around the world who their business is developing software. You know, they build product, software products, they sell software products, but also there are now lots of organizations around the world who their business may be something else. Their business may be, you know, 
selling shoes, um, running an online shop, all sorts of other all sorts of other functions. But software now underpins what they do. Maybe they've got a custom web portal. Maybe their suppliers um, interact with them via a custom in-house developed web portal. So suddenly they're a software org, even if they didn't know it. So you know, we need to think about, you know, am I actually responsible for this? And therefore, you know, what do I need to think about from a, a strategic perspective? So like I said, we've got the OS top 10, which tries to talk about, you know, these are the biggest risks. These are the biggest uh, so software security risks or biggest things you should be concerned about. But uh, yeah, that's very much not my perspective now. My perspective now is, again, more at the strategic level and thinking about you know, what are the things that I might want to think about as a security person or as a software person as to you know, why I might be seeing software security challenges in my organization and how I can build a better culture of software security awareness. So um, there won't be top 10 issues here. I'm going to talk about six issues. I think issue six is uh, plenty to be getting on with, given the, the level these operate at. But uh, let's dig into them. So there's this trope, oh, security is everyone's job. Security is developer's job. Um, but often developers aren't taught about security up front. You know, it's not really taught in universities, not taught about in boot camps. It's not something you necessarily see in online tutorials. In fact, you know, online tutorials are often famously vulnerable. You know, people say, okay, here's how you do this thing in this particular language, and you'll look into the um, you look into the code and they're like, oh, that's SQL injection. That's that's not that's not good code. I mean, maybe it works, but it doesn't work securely. And you know, developers are also rarely actually incentivized for this. They're rarely measured on this. You know, a developer get, get wakes up in the morning, they go to work, and their you know their team leader says or their head of engineering says, okay, have you built this feature yet? Have you finished this feature yet? Are we ready to release? Now, occasionally you, know, you might th see things like performance or user experience as being part of a developer's job. They might say, okay, well, you need to write this code effectively. This code needs to um, respond in a certain amount of time, or the, the user needs to understand how to use this code. But security, you know, very frequently just isn't on that radar. It's not on the developer's radar. It's not something where the engineering manager said, have you gone through the security checklist? Have you made sure it's secure before it's actually released? And that means that as a security person, we can't necessarily go to a developer and say, oh, could you just fix this? Can you just deal with this? Can you uh, help us with this security issue? If you know their main driver is making my you know, making their boss happy, and their boss isn't actually interested in that. You know we can't secure from the sidelines. We can't be um, coming to the developers and asking them to do us favors. You know, okay, can you help us out here and maybe secure the software? It's not you know it's not something that's really sustainable, and it's you know, I think it's the biggest cause of frustration, especially in that relationship between security and development, where security are telling the developer one thing, but their incentives and their job description is coming as something else. So my advice around this is, I guess, a couple of parts of this. First of all, security should be another characteristic of software. Security should be a quality characteristic of software. We wouldn't release a piece of software if it wasn't um, didn't respond fast enough. We wouldn't release a piece of software if the user can't understand it. We shouldn't be releasing software that is insecure. It should be just another characteristic of does this does this software meet the quality to be released? Does this feature meet this, uh, the quality to be released? In order to do that, we need buy-in from development management, from engineering management. Uh, I heard a colleague of uh, some uh, a colleague of mine that I've uh, worked with in the past, a guy called Francesco uh, Cipollini. He works as uh, he's got a, a vulnerability management product, and I had a chat with him, and he mentioned this idea of shift up. The idea, okay, we don't want to shift more work onto developers. We want to shift up. We want to go to the development management. We want to go to the development leadership and say, look, if you want this product to be secure. You need to start considering security as part of the software quality, as part of the product's quality. Once you have that buy-in, once that drive is coming from up top, it's going to be a lot easier to actually engage with developers and get them to, to, to you know, build security into their processes because that is being mandated from the top. Another useful thing for this is having good training, having interesting training. You know, there's lots of security training out there. Some of it is dull, some of it is very dull. You want things that are going to be interactive and things that are going to be relevant to their job role. You know, there are various suppliers out there, various products out there that will provide something that's interactive and something that's interesting. You know, the worst thing in the world is when developers are like, oh, I've got to do my security training. I'll just like click, 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 click through all these videos. we will make it engaging for them. Uh, another way of engaging them is building a security champions program. Now, this isn't just a, a one-time thing. This isn't something you start and it just happens. You need to start it. You also need to sustain it. You need to figure out how I'm going to keep this going. 
How am I going to keep this fresh? How am I going to make this something that developers want to do, not something that is forced upon them? Um, but that could be a whole lecture in itself. But ultimately, you know, these are all different ways of, first of all, getting a mandate from the top to actually do this, but also making it engaging, making it interesting. So I talked about OWASP. I think it's worthy of an item in itself. Um, many developers are not familiar with OWASP. I spent a lot of time over the last couple of years trying to go to development conferences and try and talk about OWASP because I found that security people were pretty familiar with OWASP, developers not so much. Um, if you aren't familiar with OWASP, feel free to go and look it up. Um, but ultimately, they've got all sorts of different projects, all sorts of different resources that are generally available free of charge and can provide lots of useful information. Um, be that you know, comprehensive requirements for security, be that a forum for networking and knowledge sharing, be that uh, interactive developer training. Members get access to a special platform for sort of interactive uh, software security training. Now, you know, ask yourselves, you know, are you familiar with an OWASP project that's not the OWASP top 10? Maybe you need to learn a little bit more about the projects that are on offer and how they might better help you. Um, have you been to one of your local OWASP meetups? You know, we have frequent meetups here in Israel, at OWASP Israel. Um, but more importantly, do your developers go to OWASP meetups? You know, your developers engage in this sort of thing. It's all very well security people being very familiar with what's out there, but OWASP is ultimately aimed for developers. OWASP is aimed to provide developers resources to help them build securely. So try and make sure they're included in that. Try and make sure that uh, they're also engaged in this sort of uh, activity. So yeah, encourage them to be involved in OWASP. Don't just uh, say, oh, here's no OWASP guidance, but it's some secret society that you can't... Um, get involved with, you're not going to be able to, you know, only we security people can be involved in. OWASP is for developers as well. Um, OWASP has all sorts of different projects, all sorts of different resources that can avoid you reinventing the wheel. You, know, you might not need to build your own uh, secure requirements checklist from scratch because you can find that there and then. If you're looking for something, say, you know, a simple way of tracking um, vulnerable dependencies, OWASP has a dependency track or dependency check that can help with that, certainly as, a, as an entry level thing. Um, documents like you know, ASPS, OWASP cheat sheets, which are detailed guidance on how to solve particular security problems. You know, all these are great ways of um, finding free resources to use for yourself, bring to developers, and also you know, encourage them to network, encourage them to speak to other people who are facing um, similar issues via you know, OWASP's uh, social networking. It's number three in uh, my uh, list of issues. So I guess a, long, a while ago, you know, back in the yeah, five, five, ten years ago, if you ask an organization, do you have a software security program? Do you do application security? They'd be like, oh, yeah, we, uh, we get a pen test every year and someone you know, comes in, breaks our application, and um, we either do or do not fix the results that come back. Yeah, that was very much, you know, software security five, ten years ago was very much, oh, we do a pen test. Now, you know, more recently, you know, let's say five years or sooner, for the last three, four years, you ask someone if they do software security, like, oh, yeah, we've got this tool, we've got that tool, we've got another tool, we've got SAS, we've got DAS, we've got SCA. But that's not software security. You know, those are tools that can provide support for particular problems. They can solve particular problems for you, but they can also bring their own problems. They can also bring their own challenges. You know, if these tools are poorly configured, they're going to be, bring a lot of noise. You know, like I've mentioned earlier on, tens, th hundreds, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of vulnerabilities if you've got a large organization. You, know, you can't handle that volume of, of uh, input. If they're not tuned correctly, then that's you know that's the risk you're facing. You end up with this this uh, you know, sudden huge huge overload of here a load of problems that may or may not be real. Um, it can often represent poorly aligned metrics. You know, just tracking well how many vulnerabilities have we got from this tool is not necessarily a good way of saying how secure are we. It doesn't necessarily capture um, how well are we doing. What is our actual risk? And you know, once we have this massive backlog of findings, all these things we need to get through, it becomes it becomes stressful. It becomes okay. Here's all this work that may or may not be as a result of a particular risk. You know, if we implement these tools incorrectly, if we implement these tools without thinking about the wider processes around them, then you know, there's very high likelihood they're going to cause frustration. And suddenly software security becomes frustration. I've seen this, you know, I've seen this in the wild. I've seen it organize this organizations that I worked with. You know, there's one organization I worked with where they had you know, all three of these tools and more. And they had a huge backlog. And oh, they say, oh, we'll, we'll create a security champions program. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> their, security, their security champions were voluntold. So you know, they were told, okay, you are now the security champion for this team and you are now the security champion for this team. 
And what was the security champion's job? Oh, now you you have to go back through this whole backlog and figure out what's going on, figure out what's real and what's not real. Uh, and suddenly, you know, certainly in this organization, and you know, it's, it's happened, can happen in multiple organizations where software security suddenly becomes frustration with tools. It becomes, oh, I've got to deal with this tool and that tool, and it's giving me nonsense, and it's really going to stress me out. Don't get me wrong. We're going to need tools to help multiply our efforts, to help get a scale of, you know, get, a, get, a, get a, a handle on the scale of applications that we see. But if they're badly tuned, if they're not built into an overall process that's designed to solve a particular problem in software security, they're very likely to lead to frustration. Um, so this is one of the things I give training about because I think it's uh, a very much under underestimated area and under understood area, how to build good processes around tools. But I guess if I was going to summarize that, the tool should support a goal. You know, a tool isn't a goal in itself. Oh, we're going to implement SCA and we'll be secure. No, we want to get control over um, the libraries that we've got in our organization, the potential risks from them. Um, the tool should support the goal that you're trying to achieve. Uh, you need management buy-in. It needs to be clear, okay, this isn't just going to be a security person. It's a security tool, but it's not just going to be a security tool working with, a security person working with this. You're going to need developers to support with this as well. You may need QA people. You may need product people to also be involved in these processes to decide you know, how we're going to address the results from this tool. And that's going to require, again, that shift up, that buy-in from the top. And you're going to want to take a gradual approach. You know, this isn't going to be a big bang thing where you switch everything on, you activate every single uh, rule every, and get every single result. You, know, you want to do this slowly, slowly. You want to say, okay, well, let's handle a management, manageable chunk of issues and then move on to the next ones. Ultimately, tools are not an end goal. Tools are not just some magic automation. Tools are going to be a process. You put in the process, you decide what your goal is going to be, and you decide how the tool is going to support you with that. Speaking of penetration testing, um, thank you, AI, for finally giving me a, a nice uh, graphic for the uh, market for lemons analogy. So the market for lemons analogy is basically something that's actually sort of stolen from the, uh, the uh, secondhand car market. And the idea of a market for lemons is that when someone sells a secondhand car, the seller might know what's wrong with the car. They might know that it's been absolutely thrashed, it's been driven badly, it's been in four crashes. Um, but the buyer has no idea. The buyer just sees a car, and you know, unless they're an expert mechanic and possibly <laughs> a skilled uh, forensic analysis as well, they're not going to know what the history of this car is, how well this car has been uh, treated. And that means that there's no incentive on the seller to sort of only gather high quality cars and sell high quality cars because they'll go, the buyer will go down the road to a less, let's say, honest seller who will then go and try and sell them a, a less good quality car because a buyer can't tell the quality of the car just from looking at it. And you know, pen testing is kind of in the same direction. As a buyer for pen testing, you don't really have any good way of assessing you know, how good is this organization. How good are they at penetration testing? How, you know, how good are they, are they going to be at giving me the value that I actually need? You know, I've worked on both sides of this. I've, I've worked as a penetration tester. And I've worked as someone also you know, receiving results of penetration testing and trying to sort of get a, a valuable penetration test. So I've given talks about penetration testing. This is a real challenge. You, know, you may be in a situation where there are no findings. Now, are there no findings because your application is really great and really, really secure? Or are there no findings because your tester isn't good enough and doesn't know how to find the real problems? There might be too many findings. Is that because you know, the developer, the tester is really, really good and they found all sorts of problems and maybe it's been a while and you know, you've not had such a great test recently, so suddenly there are all sorts of real security issues? Or maybe they've just flagged up everything in sight. Maybe they've run a tool and just given you all the results from the tool, whether they make sense or not. It's very, very hard to get a, a, get a read for, you know, what is the quality of this test? What is the quality of this tester? Also, very often, the findings are aimed at someone who already understands security. You know, how often do you see a penetration testing finding where it's really written for a developer? It's really written for someone who's actually going to have to go into the code and fix this. You, know, if you say, oh, do input validation, do output encoding. OK, but how is the developer going to do that? How is the developer going to do that in their actual language? So I guess my overall argument here is that, yeah, Pen testing is very, very widespread, but it's not necessarily a high value activity unless you're approaching it in a slightly more thoughtful way. And so you're trying to approach it in a way that's going to get the most value from that process. 
And you know, to be clear, this isn't a completely original thought. It's something I've spoken about in the past, but you know, back in 2012, very famous talk by a guy called Harun Mir at 44Con in London, um, talking about you know, these problems and more, the challenges behind penetration testing. So if I had to sum up some specific guidance, first of all, like I said, I have given a talk about how to get more value from penetration testing. You can see at this link here or scan the QR code. Um, a few highlights though, you know, figure out who's the tester actually gonna be. Get details on their experience. You know, did they start working at the penetration to com testing company yesterday or have they been there years and years and years? Uh, and make sure the person who's involved in the pre-sale process is the same person who's actually doing the test. You know, ask the organization to see an example report. Ask the pen testing organization, look, give us a report, an example of a report that you've given you, sanitized, obviously. If you want to get a feeling for what's the quality of the report I'm going to get, am I going to get value from this report? Am I going to feel confident giving this report to my own clients, my own customers, knowing that I'm not going to look like a clown? Ask them how they're doing that testing. What standard are they based in that testing on? You know, I mentioned the ASPS, the Application Security Verification Standard earlier. That's a classic mechanism to use as a, a benchmark for saying, here's the standard we use for performing this sort of testing. Um, if you're looking for the really high risk issues, then often getting a time limited test from one of the bug bounty organizations might be quite good at doing that. You know, bug bounty is a whole other topic that I'm not going to get into now, but the you know, most, if not all of the bug bounty companies will say, okay, we'll spend two weeks really thrashing our application, see what we find. And they get a hundred of their testers together and they'll find high risk issues. Um, it's an option, certainly something to look at, and certainly, certainly something that I've seen be effective at multiple organizations where the, the you know, found, findings from bug bounty testers tend to be higher impact overall. They may not give the most complete picture because they're optimizing on slightly different incentives. Issue five, integrating security early. You know, it's a big challenge that we come in at the end and say, here's a problem. And that, you know, that challenge works both ways. If security aren't being engaged and aren't actually trying to get in earlier on, then you know, certainly when they come in at the end and say what's going on, then you know, they're going to be unpopular. But also, you know, there's also a development buy-in requirement here as well. You know, if the development organization isn't interested in involving security, isn't bringing security in, then you know, the, the same thing is going to result. Security will finally get to see this when it's ready and it might be too late to fix things that are particularly significant. When we talk about shift left. I want everyone to throw the word shift left in the bin, uh, very much to the left, um, as Beyonce would say. I like to think about spreading left. The idea that we want to, you know, we're not just moving security away and over to the left-hand side of the uh, CLC. We want to spread it across the, the process. We want to have the security interactions at all stages of the process. We want to early on at the requirements process, we want to be doing security design reviews, we want to be doing threat modeling, we want to be doing um, you know, different, let's say, code level reviews at different points. You know, we're not trying to create massive processes at every single stage. We want some interaction at every stage of the process so that security is something that is considered, again, as part of a software characteristic, as part of the overall process of building software. Um, the biggest pain point there is make, being able to do that consistently. You know, doing a threat model once or having a design review once is quite straightforward, but having that as an ongoing process, having that involved in every feature or having you know, every um, significant feature, having a way of deciding which ones are the significant features, that's harder work. So my advice for this, first of all, you know, have a consistent set of security requirements that are achievable, but also tailored to you know, the different groups that are actually building the software that they can just refer to and they know, okay, I know I need to comply with this set of requirements, make sure that's not completely overwhelming. You know, if it's going to be a massive, massive, massive list, it's going to be really hard to deal with that. But if you've got something that's to the point and focused on the challenges the organization sees that is usable by developers, then that's going to be make life a lot easier. Uh, make sure these are customized to what that particular team is working on. Um, you want processes for security to be developer-led. You don't want always to have to rely on someone for security being in, in the room every single time you want something related to security to happen because security people tend not to scale that way. You need to be in a, a situation where the, where the process is usable by developers. For example, you know, lightweight threat modeling, something simple that developers can do themselves. You've given them some materials and they can go on and, and do that. The final big challenge I want to talk about is Security is project management. And this is an issue I've seen on multiple occasions where 
suddenly the security people who are very skilled at a particular topic, you know, security people or software security people who are very skilled at that particular idea of, okay, how do we, how do we secure this software? What security mechanisms do we need in this software? They suddenly become project managers. They suddenly become um, people whose entire day job is spent chasing, oh, have we got these metrics? Have we got this information? Have we got these tool results? How's that feature going? Um, have you actioned our results, you know, our, our request for that feature? Oh, we need to build a new project plan to plan how we're going to, you know, all sorts of different tasks that aren't actually security related, but because you know, a lot of things around security need to become a process, they end up becoming project managers. So you know, my advice here is firstly, you know, for metrics, certainly that needs to come from the top down, it needs to be something that R&D are being expected to produce, that engineering are being expected to produce alongside everything else. You know, is there security to, is there software to the required quality? Is there software, secure, is there software to the required security? If you've got a slightly larger security team, have someone, have a project manager on that team. Have someone whose specialism is as a project manager or operations, someone who can handle that coordination, handle that running around. So you've not got expensive and um, you know, very specialized security people running around chasing Jira tickets. You might need to make it clear to management, okay, well, you know, security needs this function because otherwise the security specialist is running around trying to gather these metrics. Um, that means that security can focus on what it's actually good at, which is providing guidance, providing um, security input. So those are the six key issues. Hopefully it's uh, sort of given you a slight you know, contrast, slightly different resolution from what uh, Liav was talking about, but gives you an interesting thing to think about. Okay, well, how do I approach this in my organization? What sort of things do I want to think about in my organization? How do I want to, you know, from a people and a process level, how do I want to, to take this, this uh, forward? Um, like I said, I do give training about this. I've got training coming up in uh, OWASP Global in Lisbon in uh, June and also Black Hat USA in August, which is uh, actually a virtual this time around. Um, and all around this sort of idea, you know, in OWASP, it's going to be very much about the tools, building effective processes around those tools. Um, and for Black Hat, it's more about a wider view of how do we build an effective program? How do we engage with people and engage with management in order to actually... Uh, yeah, build these processes in. So if that's interesting, feel free to check those out. Um, but yeah, I guess key takeaways. Um, developers are super important. Um, that's one key takeaway. But I guess overall, you need a strategic and collaborative approach. You know, tools is part of this, but process and people is going to be highly critical as well. That's number one. Number two, we want to make sure that we're enforcing this idea that software security is software quality. It's just another aspect of, of the uh, quality of software. And we want to be pushing from that perspective. Uh, meet developers where they are. We need to be built, interacting with their processes, building into their processes and you know, aligning with their processes. We don't want to be dragging them into what we think they should be doing because they've got a lot of other considerations that we don't want to stress them out about. Uh, and finally, tools are going to be important, but a tool is a tool to support a wider process, to support a particular goal, a particular aim that we want to try and achieve. Uh, so I hope, hope you found that useful, interesting. Um, my contact details are here. And uh, yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat or uh, yeah, get in touch with me separately and uh, I'll be happy to answer. But yeah, um, thanks, uh, Gary and Lior, for organizing this. And uh, yeah, have a good rest of your evening, everyone. Gosh, that was absolutely terrific. And, you know, I, I wish I could just sit and just listen to you all day because... You have a, a very special ability ability to distill the complexity of uh, everything that we're talking about into uh, image driven and therefore more easily digestible content. And so um, I, I have a, a quick follow up and uh, remember to our audience, you can ask questions in the Q and A. You, you referenced multiple times shifting, you know, shift up. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, uh, also spread left. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit to our audience, you know, how you actually do that, because this is all about people. And the only people that like change, in my experience, are babies who have wet diapers. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, ch change is hard. And it, like I said, it comes down to this, engage this, this senior engagement, you know, who, who is responsible for the security of this software? You know, if, if the, you know, who is responsible for the quality of the software? You wouldn't say, well, you know, the security is responsible for the quality. You wouldn't say security is responsible for performance. You're not going to say the security, you know, the person 
who's responsible for the software, the security of the software is the person who's actually building the software. Security can guide, security can provide input, security can provide tools, secu you know, security can, can uh, you know, sit, sit on the sides and help. But ultimately, the organization has to take responsibility and you know, the development organization has to take that responsibility. It's a question of you know, articulating that up to the development leadership and saying, look, this, this needs to be part of the overall process. Yeah, so it's, it's, very, it's also very easy to see when we say, okay, well, this is going to require time. Okay, we want to be able to carry out this process. This is some time from security. This is some time from developers. Okay, well, when's that going to go into the developer's time? Okay, well, the developer, the developer's time is split into two-week increments because we have two-week sprints. So every two weeks, someone sits down and decides, okay, well, this developer is going to work on this for, for this period of time. So in order to actually make sure the security is being handled, it's going to have to be accepted. Okay, well, if we want this security problem to be solved, then maybe the developer is going to spend nine days on this new feature and one day addressing this particular security thing. Maybe it's going to be upgrading a library that uh, we've identified as particularly vulnerable. Maybe it's going to be fixing some code that we wrote a while back and it's actually vulnerable, we need to fix it. But it has to be put into the part of their day job and it has to be articulated in that, in that way. Security is another part of quality and therefore security has to enter in their day job. And that has to be something that has buy-in from, from the... You know, alpha management that, you, that we can discuss with alpha management, and then they can then promote that from from up top and promote that as you know these. This is now part of your job. This is part of your day to day planning. Well, I mean, I just a quick follow on, and then we'll switch over to Vitaly. Uh, Vitaly, you can accept the presentation ability to move on. But um, you know, this notion of fatigue that you talk about, you know, it seems to me like you know it's really quite unfair that the, you know we have to be right all the time and criminals you know only have to be right once how do you keep people from burning out um and when i when i think about fatigue i i always think about i mean you know there's there's obviously different different aspects of behind it you know there's the, the people who are sort of trying to defend applications defend the you know, infrastructure all the time and they're they're you know, stressing about uh um attackers I, I tend to think about it more from the developer's perspective, and you know, I, I sort of think about it very simply as how does the developer feel when they when I walk into the room? You know, I walk into the room as a security person. Is the developer hiding under the desk, or are they are they happy to see me? Um, and to me, you know, that's that's a basis part of you know, security fatigue for developers. It's you know, how do they feel about this? Is this a process that's painful to them, or is this a process they feel happy and, and engaged with? And I want to try and make sure that it's something they feel happy and engaged with. It's something I want to I want to make sure that they feel that. Yes, we're you know, we're supported. We have the time to do this, and we um, have the you know the tools, the processes that we need in order to do this as well. It's not just something where they feel like, well, my, I have a hundred percent job developing, and then I've got an extra ten percent where I'm expected to deal with the security stuff on the side. I think that's the the key the key sort of fatigue pain point that I I I, I want to particularly try and solve. Well, I, I would follow you anywhere, you know. Um, so thanks again for that amazing uh, presentation. Now we're going to.